Okay. So we have with us today uh, some really fantastic people. Um, joining us are Mike Costio, who you know is our trend master, uh, Jared, who has put together some really great research on sustainability that we'll be talking about today, and uh, Anne, who is uh, probably our smartest person on all things consumer, operator, and big picture about the industry as well. So really great team that's going to talk to us about what's happening with sustainability. And um, I know people are going to be filing in for a few minutes more, so I figured we maybe would just start with some more lighthearted uh, announcements before we get into the serious let's save the world type of stuff. Um, as a reminder, and maybe we could start this off right now, apologize for the fuzzy picture over here, but it's the only thing I had. When you are hitting chat, which you should do right now just to make sure it works, make sure you choose the everyone option and not just hosts and panelists. So uh, if you'd hit chat right now, everyone, I'm asking everyone to do this and just say who you are, where you're chatting in from. And if you have uh, a recommended thing to watch on television, put it there too. If not, just tell us what city you're coming in from and let's share that across the industry with all of your peers. So let's everyone hit chat now. Let's make sure that's working. And uh, just, we will continue on. Now, uh, as you are all chatting and sharing your amazing Netflix uh, and HBO Max recommendations, uh, I did want to remind us that we have some fantastic new content in Report Pro. In the last um, few weeks have been some of our busiest in terms of new Report Pro content. All the stuff you see on screen right now uh, was released in Report Pro, I think in just the last six weeks. So um, there's a, a fast and furious pace to brand new, high quality, in-depth research on all things related to food, food service and the industry as a whole. Uh, if you haven't checked out Report Pro in the last couple of weeks, make sure you do so. If you haven't subscribed to Report Pro yet, what are you doing? It's, uh, it's time, there's so much great stuff in there. Um, you should make sure you check out the One Table Report, which is free for everyone. It tells us all about what's happening with operators as they um, make it through this period of inflation. Uh, you, know, you know, we got another inflation report this morning. Uh, when I first, first time I checked, the market was immediately down uh, like two and a half percent. Anyone know where it is right now? I haven't checked in the last couple of hours. Did it bounce back yet or is it still going down? Someone's shaking, not shaking their head. That's probably not a good sign. So <laughs> inflation still seems to be with us, uh, but then also what's happening with labor shortages and supply chain disruptions and what that means for food service. So this is free for everyone. Um, so make sure you check this out. Then we have some other great content that's just been published as well. Uh, a really wonderful piece on what's happening with happy hour going forward. Um, a fun piece on global pasta and noodles. It's uh, crazy to me that we were able to find this picture for the cover, but I guess it did exist somewhere. Unless we took this picture. I don't know. That would have been sort of fun too. Or maybe we made it with the AI creation machine. Yeah, really. That's, it's certainly possible. Uh, but it, I, I like the, the description here. So pull up pasta innovation with everything from Filipino to Haitian takes on spaghetti and discover the filthy rich Roman pasta that scored highest with consumers. So maybe use this in chat. Can anyone guess what that filthy rich Roman pasta is? And then maybe Mike, you could clue us in on what the correct answer is uh, in a moment or so. Uh, and of course, the state of the menu report was just published as well, which is a really great piece of work that talks about where menus are today. It builds on some of the things we covered in our very last webinar with even more detail. And there is a companion piece to this that covers adult beverage too in the state of that. So uh, make sure you check out the state of the menu as well. Um, so what is the, uh, is anyone even guessing what the dirty, the filthy rich Roman pasta is? I no, I actually don't know what that is. I don't think anybody's got, if they guessed it, it's probably so either they're okay. from this region or they read the issue. The, I've never heard of it when discovered oh, the, somebody got it. The whole link you got it. Yes. The filthy rich Roman. So what is it? So it's called it's pasta a la zazona, um, which is basically kind of a, a combination of like a carbonara and like a rich amatriciana sauce. So it's like super, super rich. It sounds so comforting and delicious. Like it should absolutely be on menu. Yeah, and I could tell everyone, you know, like all these webinars are essentially completely unscripted. And for, uh, you know, I don't know, 50 webinars or so now that Mike has been on, I actually try to ask Mike a question every time that I don't think he'll be able to answer. <laughs> he answers it 
every single time. It's really quite remarkable. So we could, <laughs> I we read could, this issue. It's such a good oh, issue. Okay, so you cheated. <laughs> yeah. But, but if, we, if we could make a digital version of you, that would be really fantastic. And with that, um, Mike, why don't I give you the floor and tell us what the hell is going on in the world of food? Well, the other issue I would say that was just uploaded to Report Pro literally last night, so it's brand new, is um, Jacqueline on our team worked on it. It's the new Food Bite, so it's a free issue available to everybody. And um, it's wild and wacky flavors from chains. So we went into scores and we looked at all of the items that scored the highest in uniqueness um, across a wide range of categories. So which chicken sandwiches were rated most unique, um, which pizzas were rated most unique. So it's some really, really cool, interesting out there things. Um, that we saw at major chains in the last year. So really fun issue. Um, so yeah, so this is our chance to kind of go over some of the, you know, weird and wacky things that are happening throughout the industry and just stay on top of the trend. So I feel like uh, people in the chat are probably already saying what this location is, but th does anybody know what this place is just based on the picture? Because it's been in the news so much over the past week. Um, this is, so it's called Dogue. And it's uh, a new restaurant in San Francisco. And so everything in that case there is not meant for humans. It's actually um, French inspired pastries created for dogs. And so during the week, it's a dog cafe and you can go in and get dog, dogachinos and little pastries like this. But then on Sundays, they do a $75 prefix menu for dogs. So it's three courses. Um, it was actually developed um, with a veterinarian. So they made sure everything on the menu is okay for dogs to eat. And it's like really fancy things. Like it's like cuts of steak with fermented carrots and like wild forage mushrooms. Um, but obviously the reason why, you know, it made the news is because it is $75. So, uh, you know, I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some of the more dog centric operators across the country, but I don't think we've seen a fine dining operator, you know, specifically geared towards pets at this point. There's so much interesting stuff here, right? So I see the little <laughs> figurines. There's like that old school, like almost rotary dial pink telephone uh, in the picture as well. Uh -huh, is yeah. Like this. But what's the reaction to this? Is it like, oh, this is so great, it's so inventive, and we're doing things for animals, or is it, you know, um, I would say it's pretty and, negative. I, I, I think I people say, think, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's like people it, think we've like, gone a bit too far if we're spending extreme so inequality. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, so let's start on this one last four. The, although, yeah, I, I'm curious to hear if anybody in the comments spend seventy five dollars on, on their pet. Um, for a single dish. So this is the other thing that was probably all over the news, if anything, I, you know, even more ubiquitous in the past week. Um, but if you, you know, pay attention to um, the House of Dragons, the new Game of Thrones show, they were doing an interview with um, two of the actors from the show. And the one said, they were talking about their favorite cocktails. And one of them said that their favorite cocktail was the Negroni Spagliato, which is basically like the spritz version of a Negroni where you replace the gin with Prosecco. And it went wild, like, right? You know, the, the way that they said, you know, the word Spagliato is in this like very breathy voice. And so if you're on TikTok, I think they've used like the clip something like a million times or 1.5 million times. And so now bars are reporting that they can't keep, you know, the ingredients for this in stock. Like they're all trying to get their hands on Campari. They're all trying to get their hands on Prosecco. Um, you know, bars across the country are selling out of it just because there's one clip has made it so popular. And actually I looked in flavor to see, we don't have Negroni Spagliato in there. We do have Negronis in there, which um, they are on, I want to say five or 6% of menus right now. And um, they score okay with people who've tried them. So I believe it's like 40% of people who've tried them, you know, like them. But spritzes score a lot better. So spritzes are on far more menus and people tend to like them better. So if a Negroni is kind of a little bit too bitter for you, that, you know, spritz version probably is um, kind of a great intro to the drink. Do you think that's like a version of safe experimentation? In some mm -hmm. way it's like, hey, we made it a spritz, so it's safe for you now. And Absolutely, I definitely. I mean, a, a Negroni is a really strong, bitter drink. And so, yeah, you know, add a little bit of, you know, bubbles to it, a little bit of sweetness absolutely makes it um, a little safer. And then the one, so Burger King was in the news a couple of times this week. One, because they have a new tagline and the new tagline is you rule. 
which I think is a really clever tagline, actually, because it works on, you know, multiple different levels there. Like there's you rule, like you can, you know, create the dishes however you want. There's you rule, like, you know, you're a cool customer. But there's also that you rule, like, you know, you're king, the burger. King. I think it's very clever, very well done. But then they were also, we were just talking about augmented reality, Jack. But they've um, developed this app as part of the campaign for this new LTO, which is their ghost pepper whopper, which comes on this orange bun with black sesame seeds for Halloween. And basically the app turns um, your phone into a ghost hunter. So you can actually take it around your house and see if there's any paranormal activity in your house. And if it uh, decides that there is paranormal activity in your house, you can get a free ghost pepper whopper out of it. So it's using augmented reality in this case in a fun way. And I think that it's not the only brand. Lucky Charms just did an activation around augmented reality where you're supposed to find gems in your neighborhood. Um, and as you know, I was looking at this and researching it, Pokemon Go, you know, kept coming up. That was kind of, I think, the precursor to, you know, all of these games. And there are the company behind it is actually what developed this app. Um, but Pokemon Go is still going very strong. They have yeah. something like 80 million people playing, 8 million regular players who play every single day. And so I think it was one of those things where it was in the news a lot, but actually there's still a, a real, really large kind of core fan base for that game. So do you get a free Whopper or do you just get the ability to buy the Whopper if you found a ghost? That, no, I think you, I think you actually get, yeah, a coupon for a free one. Oh, wow. Cool. I thought so. Yeah. And then uh, other technology news. So this was Google announced this the other week, which um, I don't know, the team always makes fun of me because I'm so tired of the word vibes. I feel like we use the word vibes for everything now. But Google is going to release a vibe check for neighborhoods. So basically it's using, you know, all of the data that they have about neighborhoods based on, you know, all the reviews that people post, all the pictures that people post. And it's coming up with what the overall vibe of that neighborhood would be. So before you travel to, in this example, you know, they were using, um, you know, Paris. Uh, before you travel to Paris, you could figure out which neighborhood is, you know, really culinarily driven. Mm -hmm. Or you can figure out which neighborhood is kind of the historic neighborhood. Um, and I think it's interesting, not just from a travel perspective, but also I feel like everybody's really curious about like how their neighborhood or maybe where their business, you know, what the vibe is and what they've decided that the vibe is. And a couple of people asked if they're going to have, you know, negative descriptors of the vibe in your neighborhood, <laughs> which um, I can't imagine that they would do, but who knows? You got to be careful. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And then um, on final piece of technology news, I think, you know, if you work in the agriculture industry, you know how far technology has come in agriculture. But if you don't, you probably don't know, you know, just how futuristic the technology being used is. But John Deere actually, so this is their fully, um, their fully um, autonomous tractor that they released last year at the Consumer Electronics Show. Um, you can see there's no farmer in there. So it actually fully tills the field without having a farmer in there. But they just recently announced that by 2030, they want to have a fully autonomous robotic um, farm equipment, um, just a whole line. So you can actually, um, when it comes to row crops, actually harvest, uh, plant and harvest uh, row crops um, from start to finish um, without using, you know, any actual workers or, or people uh, actually doing it. Um, so I think it's just so fascinating, um, you know, how these pockets uh, that, you know, John Deere specifically says they're doing it because they know this is the future when it comes to productivity, when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to profitability, they know they have to do this. Um, they would be left behind if they didn't. But I think you I see this so much in, you know, various pockets that maybe you're not even, you know, working in or interested in using technology we talk so much about AI, you know, at this point, movies are using AI, music is using AI. And there's, so there's just so much happening um, within every single field when it comes to technology that's so interesting, I think. Is this maybe one theory why you have billionaires buying up so much farmland? Maybe they think they can roboticize it and make it more efficient with the new It technology. could be, sure. It's also, I think, like rich people wanting giant tracts of farmland in Wyoming yeah, for themselves, too. but yeah. yeah. Uh, this is uh, this is kind of a funny one, but on a serious topic that relates to what we're going to talk about today. But Mentos released, they have new packaging that's made from paperboard. And so um, that's fully recyclable. 
But when they released it, they said, even though we've developed this fully recyclable packaging, most consumers don't actually recycle it at the end of the day. Only a third of consumers actually end up recycling it. And so they trained a troop of raccoons to start recycling in cities. So they spent 40 hours on each raccoon training it to actually recycle. And they got them up to 75% uh, you know, of those raccoons were recycling um, items at any given time. And so now actually, so one, it's kind of a tongue in cheek way of you know saying even animals can be trained to recycle more than humans can but it's also you know uh, just really um you know from a marketing standpoint um you have to pay attention to this like it's such a funny clever kind of way of looking at a serious topic you can even text mentos and request that the, the raccoons come to your own city and recycle in your own city which uh, i think is kind of a, a funny clever way of that looking at awesome it. so <laughs> the mentos diet coke thing is real right like that yeah. oh yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so what happens if you drink diet coke while eating a mentos does it happen and inside your body too i, I, I don't i don't that. yeah that's a good question that seems really yeah. dangerous no and i'm sure we've one i think we would have heard if it people I were dying like it been a that, i'm sure people have done it yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i bet there's people in the chat who've done it before um the, oh, this one uh, so this one i think inspired the most passionate conversation on slack channels at data central this week so earlier this week jacqueline on our team posted this um in the trend spotting slack channel and everybody was talking about whether they like eggnog or not which i feel like eggnog is kind of a very polarizing drink and then um i think jessica posted it on the larger slack channel and you had brought up the conversation about um, you know, what do people eat only at night? Because so this is a new product from Kellogg's that they're going to release for the holiday season, which is their Eggo Nog. So it's egg nogs that's flavored with Eggo waffles. And the reason they came up with it is because they found that parents were snacking on Eggo waffles late at night after the kids had gone to bed. So they used that learning and they tried to figure out a product that, you know, would also be a similarly kind of snackable, you know, occasion um, for parents at the end of the night. So they came up with this alcohol beverage. And so then you ask the question, you know, are there drinks or, you know, foods that people only eat at night? Are there foods that people only eat during the day? And I was surprised how passionate everybody was about, you know, what they only eat at night. Or, um, you know, people were arguing that they only eat dairy in the morning. Somebody said that they will only eat um, seafood in the morning. They don't consider that to be, or not in the morning. They don't consider that to be a morning food. So. Really interesting conversation. So maybe that's a question for everyone here. Can you think of a, a, like one version of that question we want to ask everybody, Mike? Like, yeah, I mean, I guess, is there a food that you only eat late at night? Um, you know, is there something, yes, you eat it as a late night snack and not and at all during breakfast. And you'll never have it in any other way. You'll never have yeah. it for breakfast. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Or vice versa. Yeah, there's something you will only eat for breakfast and you won't eat it later in the day. Yeah, tell us what you think, because I couldn't come up with one. It seems like you could eat anything anytime you want. That's but... how I feel. Yeah, absolutely. And so then this is the night. final one. So, And this is another one that um, we had a really passionate conversation about. Um, so this came from the Chicago Tribune, which was an article about how bars here in Chicago are closing down earlier because they're not seeing the late night crowds come back post COVID. So um, bars that normally would have been open till 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. are now closing you know, at midnight or even earlier in some cases um, because people are, are going out to the bars earlier and then they're leaving bars earlier. And there was a similar article um, um, that Sam from our team posted in the New York Times. So it seems to be this kind of urban trend that, you know, these newspapers across the country are reporting on that, you know, the 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. time period for a lot of bars um, just hasn't come back post-COVID. And so, um, you know, you had just mentioned it, but we do have a new SIPS report that's on late night, you know, drinking occasions. And so actually the data in there kind of pushes back against this a little bit because 70% of consumers said um, that they do go out for late night medications, which we, um, you know, had defined as any time after 9 p.m. Um, so maybe, you know, if we looked at past midnight or something, we would see, you know, what this article was talking about. And 92% of consumers said that they plan to go out for more late night occasions in the future. Um, but it's something that we're going to cover a bit more in the 2023 trends report that we're covering next year. But I just wanted to bring it up because uh, I would love to hear in the comments you know, if people have changed their own, um, you know, kind of attitudes and, um, you know, if they're going out as much um, for those late night drinking occasions as they did before COVID. Yeah, fantastic question. 
so I had one thing I wanted to add. Um, I, I <laughs> talked about this uh, last time, and I and I try to ask everyone: Is it worth spending three hundred bucks to buy a toaster that only toasts one slice of bread at a time, but is revered among those that have actually used it? And uh, so I took the plunge. Um, it was two hundred eighty-eight dollars on Amazon, and perhaps one of the best things I ever bought for the money. This thing is yeah. spectacular. It is so effing <laughs> awesome. It is called the Mitsubishi bread oven. And I would not be offended if any of you open a new tab to buy one right now <laughs> on or some other place. I think they used to be like 400 bucks, but you can get them for 288 right now. It's a single slice toaster, essentially. So you open up the lid and it'll make one piece of bread at a time, but it locks in all the moisture. So you get a, you get a result that's like nice and crispy on the outside, but like fresh baked moist bread on the inside, and it completely changes the perception of what toast could actually be. It is phenomenal. So it has a little steam release over here, and you'll be shocked at how much water is actually inside bread. So for a full-blown minute while it's toasting, just all the steam is coming out of that one slice of bread. It's amazing, and then the end result really is spectacular. It's perfectly crispy on the outside, and like a, the best fresh baked bread you've ever had on the inside. So I've been eating bread every day for the last couple of weeks now, and I look forward to it all the time. Could not recommend this thing more. So <laughs> definitely, definitely consider getting one of these. It's called the Mitsubishi bread oven. I don't earn a commission or anything. It's just awesome <laughs> to check it out. Mike, you got to get one of these things for sure. It is. I mean, I love it. Awesome. I eat toast all the time. And that no piece sucks. of toast right you're, there does look like the perfect piece of toast. Your, your toast just like... sucks compared to this. It's like toast, <laughs> it's, it, it, gets, it gets dried out, right? This thing. It, but it, I don't it, know that if all that steam is coming out, isn't it supposed to be there's even more steam? on the inside? Uh, <laughs> it, it, it lets out. It's it, look. You know, Japanese culture is to do one thing perfectly, right? Like it's like the Jiro dreams of sushi approach. They've done that with yeah. bread. Uh, and this is just with a piece of brioche, but if you get like the Hokkaido milk, Japanese milk mm. bread, that's supposed to be truly, truly next level <laughs> thing. So you can make uh, grilled cheese sandwiches. Some people put like an egg on top. Some people will lay like some apples on top with some sugar and cinnamon and it'll caramelize the whole thing for you right in here and make an instant dessert. Uh, totally, totally worth it. Okay, so that had nothing to do with anything, but I thought it was an important <laughs> PSA. We're gonna get into the meat of the topic today, to topic today which is around sustainability. Um, there is a sneak peek at our sustainability keynote that you can find in Report Pro, and we also have a brand new sustainability deep dive keynote report that will be published shortly. I'm going to share just a couple of tidbits from there, and I want to maybe get things started by having all of you type in chat. When you think about the topic of sustainability, which restaurant brands first come to mind? Really focus on chains, right? You know, uh, brands that other people would know. So just put in chat right now, what are the chain restaurant brands that you first think about when you think about sustainability? Uh, I can't see the chat as it goes by, but I wonder if uh, Jared and Mike, if you can tell me what people are typing. I'm seeing a lot of Chipotle yeah. and actually that was immediately what I thought of when I saw this. Yeah, are, are we getting a diverse group of answers? Or are we getting a lot of just like two or three brands keep coming up over and over again? I would say about three or four brands. I see a lot yeah. of Panera, Sweet Greens. There um, we go. Yeah, so so that that's sort of what I expected, right? It's not that each person has like you know one that they think we, there's a small cluster that really owns the mind share in this space, and I want to use this as like a premise, and this is you know, maybe an unpopular position, but I think it is true. When it comes to sustainability, you really have to lean very heavily into this if you want to be differentiated in the marketplace. You know, virtually every company or brand has some sort of a sustainability effort. Um, but a lot of times those are more, from, let's say, for like the internal like employees there to satisfy them that we're doing something as a company. For this to really register with consumers and for you to be one of those three or four brands that's being you know, typed up in chat, you have to make this a core part of your central proposition. It can't just be one more logo you know, added to a list of 100 different other logo things that your company does. So... I would like, I'd like to ask all of you this as well. Which of these things, I'm going to put up a poll, um, would you say uh, you associate with sustainability? This is choose all that apply. So check all the ones that apply to you. And if you'd like all of them, then check all of them. So 
Uh, make sure you check everything that applies. And after you check all of your options, then hit, then hit enter. Uh, and again, if, you, if all of them apply, just check all of them individually. And uh, I think we're gonna get to see the uh, effect that we were sort of predicting uh, we would see over here. Okay, we have several hundred votes already. So uh, in this, for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and end the vote. And let's take a look at what you all said. All right. So take a look at this. Um, basically a majority of people, a vast majority of people voted for every single one of these topics. And I think that's the next major um, insight, which we all sort of knew, but you know, we just sort of spelled it out right here, which is sustainability is an incredibly broad topic that encapsulates so many different things. Um, and it's sort of hard to define too, because our definition of what is sort of like in that bucket of sustainability today could be quite different than the types of things that might get added to it tomorrow or the next week or the next year. So you want to think of this as a very, very broad theme that touches multiple domains of life. I and mean, look at our own votes over here, right? We're like 80, 90% on most of these. And even the one that got least voted on, which is protecting animal species, was also still a majority of the vote. I could have added 50 more things to this poll. And if you all had the patience, they'd probably all be above 50% as well. So we should know that we're talking about something quite broad and we wanna be able to sort of hone in on some aspects that are particularly important or top of mind with consumers. So Jared, I might wanna just start with you. Um, this is uh, something from the, the keynote that you've been working on, which is just how important making sustainable choices are to people. We see that two thirds of Americans say it's important to them, you know, uh, about 25%, 23% say it's very extremely important. Another 41% say it is important in some way. What else do you see here that might inform us on where consumers' heads are at. Definitely. So, you know, even looking where consumers live, their household income and their political party, across all those, you know, just broad, diverse swaths of life, we still see that it's important to, you know, the majority in most cases here across the board. Um, and, um, you know, even despite like, uh, you know, low income, high income, it's not that different. Uh, and same goes for geotype too. Yeah. So no matter how you want to cut it, it's pretty hard to find a group that doesn't care or doesn't think it's important in some way. So this is fairly universal. Now, again, the definitions may vary a little bit from one person or one group to the next, but the general thought or theme of sustainability is fairly, you know, almost universal across groups. And we showed that one breakout of political affiliation because I thought it was sort of interesting, right? I mean, actually, I'll go back to it. You can see that the, you know, perceived importance of sustainability is highest among Democrats, uh, less so among independents and less so than that among Republicans, but still sitting at 50%, right? Even among uh, Republicans. And then if you sort of say, well, let's maybe look at what people, um, what their attitudes are towards sustainability, some of the statements at the top, and you compare that with, let's say, the behaviors that people are engaging in around sustainability, you start seeing something really sort of interesting, which is when it comes to like these sort of attitudinal statements, they are generally fairly elevated among Democrats versus Republicans. I believe it's important to make sustainable choices for the number, which is the metric we just saw. I strongly agree that recycling has a substantial positive impact. I think grocery stores can do more to reduce waste. I'm more likely to buy sustainably sourced items. You know, all have a pretty positive gap relative uh, to the two political parties. But if you look at the actual, some, like some of the actual behaviors, like things that people are actually doing, the gap sort of uh, erases in some cases, right? You know, I use re reasonable bags when shopping. Yeah, there's not so much of a gap there. And Republicans actually say they're more likely to do that than Democrats are. Now that might be in function of age and some other demographics. Um, but if you look across all of those sort of behavioral metrics at the bottom, the gaps are nowhere near as extreme as the ones that we see up top. So to me, this sort of says, you know, everyone's, you know, open to doing things. And if we want to sort of do what's right for the world and, uh, and keep this place nice and protected, it's probably good to focus on the behavioral aspects that people tend to already be open to. And if we can avoid the sort of, uh, I don't know, intense discourse that tends to polarize and demonize in that attitudinal area, that might actually be better, right? We can sort of focus on things that are agreeable to. And I think this is actually a very positive thing because the evidence is here. People are willing to do the right thing or certain types of the right thing. 
if we don't overly politicize those things. And I think that gives us something to build on. I don't know, Jared, if you had any uh, further observations here. No, I completely agree with what you just said. So appreciate this image that you submitted. Um, <laughs> Thank you. What are we seeing here? So this is one of my favorite findings in the report. Um, so the sustainability keynote is going to drop any day in Report Pro. Um, and in it, you know, just see so much enthusiasm, um, more than I anticipated for sustainable initiatives. But this one question, I guess, would be, you know, the inverse of what I just said. So we asked consumers, um, would you eat a delicious food? And then we asked operators, would you menu a delicious food? even if you knew it was horrible for the environment. And the majority said they would um, for both consumers and operators. Um, you know, super fascinating, but uh, the report kind of dives into, you know, it's not one or the other, you know, we can have our cake and eat it uh, too on this. Yeah, I mean, look, the, 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 you know, sustainability is one of those things where it's a key driver of consumer behavior, but it's not the exclusive driver. And if you're an operator and you can make something delicious, I mean, you probably got into being a chef because you wanted to make delicious food. You probably didn't get into it because of your sustainability impulse, let's say. And so in you know, so I think that's totally common sense. Did you see any difference by generational group or demography relative to the consumer stat here? Do you remember anything? Off the top of my head, and we do have this broken out, I believe that older consumers were more skewed, more sustainable on this way, on this one. Uh, so like, I think uh, Gen Z millennials probably were more likely to eat a delicious food, if it, even if it was horrible. Oh, that's interesting. I'd be curious to see what the political affiliation breakout looks like as well. Uh, we should look into that. Now, this I think is hysterical, uh, which is, we asked people, which generation makes the most effort to preserve our environment? And guess what people said? Their own generation. And, you know, I, I don't know. I thought, I, I love this question. I thought that was super fascinating. Um, you know, it, there is another cool finding here too, though. And that's as, as we age, we're less likely to benchmark those generations off of each other. That's it. That, that, is, that is true too, right? That no generation in particular, that number keeps going up as we get into progressively older generations. Now, I think this is probably going to be something we discover for almost any positive thing that we ask people about, whether it's sustainability or any other topic that's, you know, any other action that's supposed to be positive for the world or that you should, is supposed to be commendable. But I don't know. I feel like over here, this is a pretty extreme effect, right? I mean, uh, forty-seven percent of Gen Z are saying it's me. I wonder who the who the people are in each generation that actually say it's someone, some other generation that does a better job, right? I'm twenty-two percent of Gen Zers think that millennials do a better job than they do. I guess they see their friends doing really bad things. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, what are people actually doing? What are some of those behaviors? Uh, what do you see here, Jared? I think this like really, you know, just hints back into the poll we just did uh, and looked at, you know, there's just tons of different ways to be sustainable. And I think, you know, whether we realize it or not, we probably are all doing sustainable actions in some different ways. Um, you know, some common ones like saying, oh, you know, I don't need utensils with my takeout. Uh, maybe I'll skip meat for this meal. But I thought it was fascinating that one in six consumers say they would eat lab grown meat. And I've been kind of watching, you know, consumer affinity for lab grown meat just kind of steadily tick up over the years. And I think it's probably due to more plant-based becoming, uh, you know, more ubiquitous. Um, but another thing on here that I thought was also fascinating was just one in six composting food waste at home, because that seems actually like pretty hardcore to me. Um, I actually learned that, you know, several people on our content team, I think compost at home, which was very fascinating. So we made a prediction six years ago, uh, which is that you know, there are a couple of things that you're going to see uh, increased consumer acceptance of that used to be thought of as weird and everyone's saying no way, but it'll eventually maybe even get to a majority slowly and surely. One is lab-grown meat or cell-based meat, as it's called. And two is people having their own uh, humanoid uh, robot companion. Uh, I think that number is going to continue going up over time as well, right? It's like, hey, we're going to have our own like, you know, love robot or something. Ew! But I think in... Over the course of the next 20 years, it'll be normalized. Um, and what do you see over here? Um, and we see that at the top, we have single-use plastics. Did it surprise you that that was number one? 
No, not at all. No, certainly. And, and I think we've got slides later where, especially coming out of COVID, where, you know, there was a lot more takeout, a lot more off-premise. And so we certainly see, you know, a lot more of those single-use plastics kind of moving through our own lives, I think. So I think we're all the more aware of it. And it's just, it makes good visual images, right? You know, turtles with straws, you know, up their nose. And so I think it's just something yeah. that, that tends to get a lot of press and a lot of play because it's just very flashy. Well, and that's the thing with COVID, it was interesting because at the beginning of COVID, it became a personal health and safety and we used way more plastic wrap stuff than ever before. You even had paper straws wrapped in plastic. I mean, all sorts of craziness, um, but it is number one with a bullet here, right? It is 46% so much higher than anything else on the list. So we thought it'd be you know, a good idea to maybe just deep dive into what consumers think about plastics in particular. So I would actually just flash a couple of statements and I'd like all of you in chat to guess um, which one you think it's a higher level agreement between the two. So this is from a con among consumers. Um, statement A is it's my responsibility to reduce or eliminate the use of plastic disposables. Um, and statement B is, yeah, my use of plastic dis disposables don't really impact the environment much one way or the other. Which one of these two things do you think has a higher level of agreement? I'll wait probably 15 seconds. You can just say A or B. Maybe that's the easiest way to do it in chat. Just type in A or B. Uh, are we seeing more A's or B's? I would say quite a bit more A's. Yeah, that makes sense, yeah, right? More A's, yeah. So 58% agree with the former and only 10% agree with B. Let's try another one. Uh, I support government regulation to limit or eliminate single-use plastics. That's A. Or B is the government should stay out of the issue on single-use plastics. Uh, so hit hit chat A or B and uh, and what are we seeing? Yeah, I think this one's a little more split evenly. A little more split. Yeah, I mean definitely again, A's and B's, but and we're not asking people your opinion. We're asking you what you think the consumer's um, opinion is on this. But do you think is it like fifty fifty that people are guessing? Yeah. Uh, so actually, this was sort of surprising. It's it's more the former than the latter. How about this one? Uh, recycling single-use plastics is not enough. They need to be reduced or eliminated. That's statement A. Versus B is, you know, if you recycle and properly dispose of stuff, this can help solve um, a lot of those related environmental issues. People more likely to agree with A or B. You got to do more than recycling. Pretty, pretty even too. Yeah, so far it's pretty even. Uh, this, one was, this, this, this one was some yeah, yeah, C's possible too. Uh, so th this one was a little bit more split. So I think the pretty even uh, vote makes sense. But you can see there are a lot of things where when you get to the nuances, there are differences of opinion, right? We all think sustainability is a good idea. We all want to protect things. We want to do. We're all willing to do these basic behaviors. But when we get into the the, the details, that's when people have a little bit more disagreement. How about this final one? I'd be willing to pay more for sustainable disposable products or uh, I'm willing to use them, but I would not pay more for them. Which got a higher share of the vote? I feel like the audience here is going to guess pretty well on this one. Yep. What Heavily towards B. Yep. Yeah, a lot of Bs. Yep. Yeah, and and I bet you some of the A's when it comes down to it won't actually follow through as well. That's just human behavior. We're asking, we're asking. Aspirational. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So uh, let's look at some stats. Almost um, half of operators say that social media has changed how food service uh, operators need to think about their values and the values they put forward. 45% um, say that actively sharing their, their key values um, with their community can positively impact the, impact the local community. About a third say it's more important, today, more important today than ever to take a stance on key issues. And only 19% say personal values have no place in our food service operation. It's really quite, pretty interesting. Like when we go and we, we and you know we talk to an audience live someplace and we ask like, hey, you know, do you agree with the statement that food brands and restaurants should take a public stand on public issues? Most people in the industry industry sort of say, no, 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 that's not a good idea because I think we're all aware of the liability and maybe stepping on a landmine type of a thing. But consumers don't feel that way at all. Some, something like seventy one percent think that food brands and restaurants should take a stand. And even among operators, which is what we're seeing over here, you have a pretty healthy percentage of operators saying, yeah, maybe you know, letting the, the public know what our values are is a good idea. So I think we continue to move in this direction. We've been talking about values being a major domain of growth for a while now, and it looks like it just sort of keeps on going. 
And when it comes to something like just sustainability, I know, Jared, if you want to talk about some of the places that an operator might learn about sustainability. Definitely. Um, I thought this one was super fascinating. So for here, we asked operators, like, where do you learn about sustainability? And um, actually, trade shows was the most prominent place, and beating out even the internet, which I thought was pretty, you know, crazy, actually, to think about. Um, and I think that, you know, it makes sense. I remember going to the NRA show earlier this year, and there's a ton of that. There's tons of robots yeah. and stuff. And I think that may have less to do with specifically how much sustainability gets, you know, over featured uh, at a trade show or food show, and more to do with the fact that food shows are still a very important uh, source of discovery for operators. Um, you know, we don't talk about things like distributor food shows very often, but they are really the backbone for a lot of what happens in the industry. So you go there to learn about new products, what's going on, uh, and you learn about other stuff like sustainability when you're out there as well. Or you read the Daily Dog uh, or something, <laughs> just chock full of good stuff. Um, and what do you see here, how sustainability influences what operators put on their menu? Uh, how would you read this, right? It's one of those things where it's like, oh, it's only 10%, but you have a big, big chunk that says somewhat. How do you interpret this, Jared? Um, I, you know, I actually, this was a lot higher than I anticipated. So I think that when I look at this, I see that, you know, if you go to a restaurant and order something, odds are in some manner or, or not sustainability uh, influenced what you ordered. So very fascinating. And one in 10, it super influenced it. Um, yeah. So you have 40% of operators saying, I don't even think about this at all when I put together my menu, but you have 60% almost that think about it a little bit and 10%, like you said, are you know super influenced by it. But what about not just what the operator menus, but what about the products that they purchase? So this is interesting that that 10% has now grown to 14% and the um, percentage that don't care about it at all has now shrunk to just about a quarter. So almost 75% of operators, their purchases are at least somewhat influenced by sustainability and one in seven say it's heavily influenced by sustainability. So that's yeah. actually super interesting because like normally you think like, oh, an operator will only want to do what they can pass along to the consumer on the menu in some way so they can get credit for it. But here it looks like there's just an underlying desire to do the right thing among operators, even if there's not a business proposition necessarily. Uh, operators are people too, right? Yeah. Uh, so, Talk to us about this, Jared. Um, what does sustainability matter to your operation if you're an operator? This was also extremely fascinating. So we asked, you know, how, why does sustainability matter? And, you know, often far away, the top reason was, you know, it's just everyone's uh, responsibility to take care of our environment. And what's interesting is that we asked this question to consumers too, you know, why does sustainability matter in your own opinion? Identical 60% of consumers, uh, you know, shared that sentiment, which was also the top reason for them. Um, but taking a look at this list, you know, those top three re reasons are all kind of similarly in that altruistic vein. Um, you know, it's not really like, you know, what you were saying earlier, you know, there's a few brands that capture that mind share of sustainability, but that's not the motivation for most people that most operators that interact with it. Um, you know, it really is about the future sustainability. Yeah, it's interesting because right, it's it's not like there's a very specific reason. Um, it's it's not something that's definitively precise or quantifiable in some way. It's just people want to do the right thing, right? And 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 that's like you said, it's altruism. It's just wanting to do the right thing, and that's a that's an powerful force. Um, but at the same time, um, we did ask people, hey, what did COVID do to you? Did it make your operation more sustainable, less sustainable, or was there really no change? So I would look at the top and the bottom lines for more sustainable and less sustainable. And it's pretty interesting. It depends on what type of an operator you are, right? If you're a restaurant, you're more likely to say that it's made me more sustainable. But if you're an on-site um, place, right? Uh, a cafeteria, a hospital, a school, a college, you're much more likely to have said that this made you less sustainable in some way, which has to do with the mode of service and what gets taken out, obviously. So, um, you know, things are snapping back to normal. We'll see where it goes from there. But um, you know, it was pretty clear when COVID hit that sustainability definitely took a back seat for a while uh, so that we could protect ourselves. And Jared, why might operators not do more sustainable things? Definitely. So here we see the barriers to it. And I think, you know, unsurprisingly, you know, high costs, especially in this economic environment, are the top barrier. Um, and, you know, 
good considerable amount too feel that you know they might not have access to sustainable products from their suppliers um and another one that i thought was interesting and this you know we see this a little bit later um but you know employees might just not be so mindful they might just be using resources you know willy-nilly um and that one's probably more addressable than some of these other ones on this list which is interesting um but you know the utility bills is also interesting uh because we'll take a look at that too yeah, I mean, I think it's this is something we should keep in mind. I mean, if we're of the minds that the economy may not be so hot for some time and that operator margins are already largely crushed, I mean, we see from the one table research they're highly compressed. Their internal impulse to to do more sustainable things uh, may be overrun by their need to stay in business, uh, and we should be cognizant of that. And to the extent that the supplier community can build more sustainability into their products and practices, that'll make it easier for an operator to make that sustainable choice without having to take a hit, an additional hit in their margins. Uh, you know, because as we saw with people wanting to protect their health during COVID, like that came first and then sustainability came second. If it comes to a business, staying in business as a restaurant or going out of business, they're going to stay in business over the sustainable thing first. So if the supplier community can help out and offer more sustainable choices that don't cost more, that would be a big plus. So we talk about plastics as one of the areas. We're going to dive into three areas of sustainability in particular today. Plastics was the first one. Uh, we're going to do a quick dive into another one, which is just around what's happening with hunger. So here's um, a report from uh, the World Health Organization. And basically, for many years, you know, if, if you were able to draw this chart going back you know, decades into like the early 1900s, you'll see we've done a pretty good job as, uh, you know, as a global society of reducing world hunger. There's still certainly a lot of it that exists, but, um, but we've made really good strides for, uh, for decades and decades and decades. It kept going down and down and down. And now all of a sudden in that COVID and post COVID period, we're seeing um, real threats of predictions that um, hunger and food insecurity will actually increase um, at a global level in the, for the next few years. So that, that is sort of a concern. You can see that the projections are, you know, you know, pretty broad ranges, which is why those years for 2021 and 2022 and 2020 are give, given in those shaded areas because, you know, they're not exactly sure where it's going to be precisely. But um, hunger may be, you know, I, I remember back in like the 80s, we, we talked about like hunger all the time and you'd see a lot of, you know, public TV spots about it. And it was a, a big part of conversation about the right things to do for you know, the world and how you can help. And then we haven't heard as much about it as I think the problem sort of got a little bit better. Uh, it looks like it could get worse. And you're gonna hear more and more about um, hunger and what this means. And you know, I thought it was interesting, Jared, that consumers say, hey, um, I'd be more likely to visit a, a restaurant or food service place. The number one thing they said is, if I knew that they donated unsold food to those in need, right? So uh, I think the typical consumer uh, in the US doesn't yet realize that there might be um, uh, a global hunger crisis that is upon us. But as that becomes more apparent and louder, this existing impulse to work with, you know, visit restaurants that donate unsold food and do other things to, to help with hunger is only going to grow, I think. Was there anything else that you saw over here? I, mean, I don't think we have to go through all the different items, just high level stuff. Well, I think it's interesting that, you know, all these issues have, you know, a considerable amount of um, enthusiasm from uh, c- consumers, but that I think just, you know, more than anything else, food service, you know, donating food. I think that makes a lot of sense. So there's some restaurants doing some interesting things in the food waste space. Mike, can you give us a quick tour of what the heck this crazy looking place is? Yeah, I'll be really quick. I know we have uh, about 10 minutes to go, but um, I mean, speaking of unsold food, you know, upcycling and using food waste in kind of any capacity, I think is so key. So if you're in San Francisco, I think you have to go visit this restaurant, which is called Shuggie's Trash Pie. And that's basically, you know, kind of the ethos behind the entire business, using things that would normally be wasted in, you know, all of the different menu items. And I think the cool thing about it is it doesn't look like a chore to, you know, be sustainable here. Like this is the interior of the restaurant. It looks fun. It looks exciting. It looks like a party. Like they're doing I, a really good job of, of, you know, making it seem exciting. I find this to be visually offensive. <laughs> <laughs> I do not like this at all. It's weird. It's about 
And so, um, so it's actually um, the people who started the Ugly Pickle Company. So they were already working in the space where they were taking, um, you know, various produce options that would have been wasted and they were turning them into pickles. But they decided they would start a food service operation and that became this, which is Shuggie's Food Waste Paradise. And so it's basically taking, you know, foods that would be wasted from all across the supply chain. So sometimes it's a farmer reaching out and being like, hey, I have, you know, cases and cases of tomatoes that are going to spoil tomorrow and I don't know what to do with them and they'll take them. Sometimes it's, um, you know, working with um, some of the, the protein brands who, you know, are maybe wasting beef hearts or fish bellies or whatever it is, and they'll put it on the menu. And the average item at this restaurant has about three to five components in it um, that would otherwise be wasted. Yeah, crazy looking food. Is that like a lasagna or is that a pizza? It's pizza. This right? is a pizza. Yeah. And so the crust for this pizza uses um, the oat milk, the oats that are wasted from oat milk that they actually make in-house. And then they use the whey that comes from making their cheese and the pizza. So it's very like visually appealing, like it's comfort food. It's not necessarily like, you know, super, super healthy foods. Like the idea is truly about sustainability. Do you think this actually tastes as good as a regular pizza? Or, or, I, would, I, would, I would think so, yeah. Okay, we'll see. It looks very good. Yeah. <laughs> this is cool. Yeah, this is cool. This is their only dessert on the menu. And it's called Two Bites of Chocolate. And they use at the bottom of it, there's um, some discolored walnuts that they were able to get their hands on. So they turn that into a walnut butter. Um, they actually use on top of it, I think there's like discolored um, banana peels that are used in this dessert in some capacity. But I think the coolest thing is that they use leftover pizza crust crumbs and um, they actually like toast them and put it on um, in here for some texture. So um, just using, you know, everything all across the menu. And you can see the menu on the next screen. They use terminology like a lot. So like, you know, like they'll actually use um, words like, um, you know, ugly mushrooms are in here, excess dough crumbs are in the mussels. Um, you can see that the buffalo everything is chicken wings, but it's also livers and gizzards and hearts, so things that people wouldn't ne necessarily be eating. So, you know, they actually use terminology that lets you know that you're eating things that might otherwise be wasted on the menu. I feel like if we tested any of these items in scores, they would test terribly. Like, no one wants to eat the livers, gizzards, and hearts, do they? <laughs> I think that one would test terribly, although they actually they use beef hearts in their meatballs and they say mm. that it's a really good kind of like introduction to beef hearts because you know they're mixed up in a meatball and they've been able to change some minds about eating beef hearts because of the meatballs oh, very cool uh and then quickly this is an app uh what does this do yeah so there's a couple apps so this is the flash food app and then the next screen is the too good to go app but they're basically apps that are connecting consumers with you know either menu items or groceries that would otherwise be wasted so flash food connects you with grocery stores that are about to throw away items and then the too good to go app connects you with operators in your city or town that are um, you know otherwise going to throw out um, pastries or menu items or whatever it may be and I think the two interesting things about this are one that you know it's using technology in a way you know that connects people um, with a way that makes it really easy for them to be sustainable but two is I think we've talked so much about you know price and everything is more expensive if you want to be sustainable and a lot of people are choosing these apps specifically because the items are actually less expensive yep. so you know that grocery store was going to throw them away anyway uh, you know that operator was going to throw away that menu item anyway so they tend to be around 50% off for those items so um, I actually think there's a real opportunity for them as you know prices you know continue to increase for apps like this to to really um you know catch on with consumers what a great idea it's like a good for the world version of groupon or something yep it's good stuff um okay we're gonna speed through a couple of final things um we could see when we talk to operators what your utility bill sort of looks like 65 percent they say the utilities have gotten uh they're using more utilities than they have over the course of the last year um, not many people say that utilities have actually gone down. Most are saying the thing has gone up. And the number one reason they're saying using more utilities, not the, not just they're paying more, but they're actually using more, is because above average weather has required more AC or heating, right? It's been in response to weather conditions around them. And of course, this squeezes margins further. So um, who here knows what this is? I, you've probably all heard of this, right? I don't know if people have seen this picture or others. Uh, do you guys know what this is? Um, it's it's sorry. You know, this is like a very small picture of a much bigger thing. It's the it's part of the Greenland ice sheet, right? You can see this thing is actually fairly massive. You can see it here. 
on a map. It is a big old hunk of ice. It's one of two giant hunks of ice that sit on land right now. And you know, some of the models say that, hey, if we get to sustain two, two degrees centigrade sustained temperature rise, uh, you'll start to see sort of like an irreversible effect where that thing's just gonna start melting and melting and melting. And eventually it'll get to some critical mass where the whole thing's just going to melt. Um, this thing is like a mile tall and it's like bigger than California. It's just a giant hunk of ice. And when you have ice that's on land that then melts and goes into the water, water starts going up, right? And you can sort of see what's happened with global surface temperature. And I wanna say very clearly right now, uh, I don't have a public opinion. Data Central doesn't have a public opinion on what's happening with climate change, what causes it, if it's anthropogenic, if it's not. Um, we're looking at this in terms of what consumers are seeing and what they're telling us they plan on doing as it relates to food. And one of the things that you've probably all seen this chart or something like it, which is what is global surface temperature covering both land and water look like uh, over the last few years? It's been really quite hot recently. We're not saying why, it's just been pretty hot recently. And the, some of the models and climate models are very, very complex. Most of them are probably wrong, you know, but directionally, maybe they're right, who knows. Some of them say, hey, once that thing starts to melt, it may just melt and melt and melt. And if that thing melts, let's say that Greenland ice sheet, if just that one thing melts completely over the course of a couple hundred years, that would cause ocean levels to rise how much, do you think? A foot? two feet, try 24 feet. And that's actually smaller than, than the Antarctic ice sheet. If that thing also melts at some point, water levels would go up to the um, elbow of the Statue of Liberty, roughly. Right, so I mean, you're gonna hear stories like this, which sound very, very scary. And if you look at what consumers say they care about, well, these are the things they care about. The economy, then healthcare, which are current conditions that impact them today and then climate is right there, number three. And if you think about climate, this is really something where people are so worried about the future. It's really unusual for people to be almost as worried about the future as they are the current. Like people are saying, I care so much about this, even though it's probably not gonna touch me, you know, in, in the really horrible ways, but I wanna make sure the future is protected, that I'm gonna rank it number three on this list and put it ahead of a lot of other things that actually impact my life in a material way today. So people care about climate, and you're going to hear a lot more about this, but there's other sides too, right? So you can look at coal-fired, this is new coal-fired power capacity in megawatts. So basically one megawatt, uh, I think it you know, can power, let's say, five or 600 homes, uh, average homes or something. Do you remember, like, was it, was it back to the future? Was it like 1.3, 1.2 gigawatts or something? Like, that's actually a lot of power. Um, this is how much new, new additional incremental coal-fired power capacity has been brought online each year in various countries for some time. You can see the US um, starting around 2010 uh, just stopped doing it to the point where we brought nothing new coal online since 2014. Doesn't matter so much though from a global perspective when you have other countries that are adding a ton. You can see where India is, but there is something that is conspicuously missing from this chart, right? There's a country that's not on here that would probably be a pretty big one. And that's because it dwarfs everything else. So if I actually pull back a little bit, the chart really looks like this when you throw China into the mix. So we have to understand too, like, hey, as much as everyone cares about climate and wants to do something about it, and we have debates around specific policy matters and whatnot, there's also sort of countervening points that some people say, well, then, you know, this is going on too at the same time. So there will always be some level of debate. Again, we're not saying what's right or what's wrong. We're just saying that there will always be conversation. It will always be, no pun intended, a little bit heated around some of these topics. You know, we see that uh, they were gonna close a nuclear power plant, uh, Diablo Canyon. And because we're having power issues in the state of California and we needed more power, they have kept it open for five more years, which is probably you know, may maybe a good thing. Uh, and we see that we're, we're predicting perhaps a really bad energy crisis in Europe, which has already started, but could be made worse if we have a particularly severe winter. So you're going to hear all these sort of points of conversation around climate. Some saying we have to do everything we can right now in the moment, no matter what. And others saying, no, 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 we need to mitigate a little bit because we have these other things that are very in our face today. And we can't go completely in that direction overnight, or it's only going to make things worse and cause more hunger and starvation and suffering.
You'll see things with gas prices where people say, I want to do things for the climate and make things better. But oh boy, once gas hits six or seven dollars a gallon, maybe I don't feel as strongly about that anymore. The point is the underlying desire to do something well, good for the world and take sustainable action is absolutely there. We see it in the numbers, but there's so many smaller topics related to this because we said sustainability is so incredibly broad that there will always be disagreement. And as long as there's disagreement, there will be conversation. As long as there's conversation, the topic of climate will continue to be in the forefront of so much that we do. And the migration from the, the climate conversation being about fossil fuels to now being about the food industry is real. You'll hear more and more about that as well. So I think it's important for every company to think about what they want to do relative to climate. Do you want to have a public position or not? And what do you could do to help in some way? And hopefully in a way that is... Um, you know, agreeable to virtually everyone. I think there's a lot we could do over there, right? You know, some people say eating sustainably is one of the easiest ways to combat climate change. 65% of consumers say that eating sustainably is going to help, help the climate. 67% of consumers say we want the industry to take the lead on this particular initiative. Um, and you see more restaurants sort of jumping into it. So this is only going to get louder and louder. Here's a restaurant chain, Next Level Burger, that's made climate core to their central proposition, right? It's all about um, fighting for the climate. Uh, this is gonna be a louder and louder and louder thing for many, many, many years. Uh, and if we could find some common ways to just make the world a better place, I, I, think, uh, I think there are ways to do that without it turning into a gigantic argument. So I know I sort of sped through the last couple of seconds there because we ran over on time. And I'd like to give you the last, uh, uh, the last word, anything you wanna add before we uh, hang things up? Oh, geez. Uh, not really That's putting someone on. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, check, check out your local buy nothing group. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Do, do your own little part in your own little way. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think it, to me, it's, it's just such a big topic. We know the, the conversation is going to get louder and there's going to be disagreements on some of the you know, more specific policy points and whatnot. But that's what's going to keep it a very loud conversation for a long time. But we focus so much in culture on things that people disagree about that we forget that we actually agree on, you know, probably like 90% of the things that are important in life. And at the core, people want to do the right thing. Uh, and there is that altruistic feeling that cuts across all the different consumer groups and types and operators feel it now too. Uh, I think if we get behind that uh, and focus on some of those things, we'll make a much bigger dent um, than if we just scream and yell at each other. So. Uh...